Welcome back to episode three of the Tennis Doctors. Uh, this is our Wimbledon quarterfinal men's uh, draw recap and looking forward to the semifinals and the rest of the championships. Um, Jay Shreeler with here with me here, Dr. Bilal Ahmed. Hey, excited to talk some tennis. And Dr. Arjun Watani. Hey, excited too. Big break away from residency for these two. This is um, well deserved, and you know we're gonna just quickly recap what happened this this round, right? So. Well, our last episode, we went through the draw and what we thought was going to happen. And then, you know, a couple of big things just really wrecked the draw. And, and I don't think we, we can talk more about them maybe after the event in terms of how they pertain to the rest of the season. But I think the, the big losers, right, Matteo Berrettini um, had to pull out because of COVID. And we're, we're talk about the implications of what that meant for what happened for that section. Um, Marin Cilic out of the draw, Roberto Batista Agut out of the draw, all with COVID. And I think that really caused ripple effects, especially for the matches we saw today. We also had a favorite from ours, Felix Ajer Alassim, go out in the first round. And that also had ripple effects for what we're going to talk about today. And then we, we, we talked about section two. We're going to get to section two. Section two is the kind of the open season section. We all thought Hubert Hurkacz would kind of be the favorite, but we we're wondering how he'd handle being the favorite, given that he's never been the favorite in a slam quarter. And he didn't handle it well. He lost in the first round in the fifth set in the match he probably could have won a couple of times. And that section just became open, right? So let's recap the quarters. We had Novak, the three five setters and one straightforward match. Uh, I'll start with the straightforward match. Um, today, Nick Kyrgios took out Christian Garin. Um, it's odd that Kyrgios was in the only straightforward match, but that was pretty routine. And, and we kind of all expected that looking at that matchup on paper. Um, we also had three five setters, right? So we had Nori taking out Golfin in a five set match, um, making the British crowd very excited yesterday. We had Novak Djokovic um, coming back from two sets to love down against Yannick Sinner, uh, who I don't think any of us really expected to make that bigger run. Um, and we'll talk about his prospects later in the episode. Uh, coming back to win that match, Djokovic and Nori will be the first match on center likely on Friday. We're recording this on Wednesday. And then Rafa Nadal in a five set tussle with Taylor Fritz was able to take that match in a fifth set. But if there's like 15 layers to that match, we can unpack because it was definitely not straightforward. So let's start here, though. So we have Sinner and Fritz, and I think they're really below, they're very parallel, right? Because they're 10 and 11 seeds. Sinner was the 10th seed, Fritz was the 11th seed. Um, they're a little different age wise, but they've had a similar sort of rise. Sinner was sort of an early bloomer, Fritz a little bit of a late bloomer. And they're these guys who are kind of hovering on the edge of the top 10. Um, Fritz won his first Masters this year at Indian Wells. Sinner reached the Miami final a year ago. Sinner has been a little more consistent getting deep in the slams the second week. But Fritz is starting to become pretty consistent, at least on non-clay surfaces, getting a little deeper. And they both had an opportunity to take out one of the big two. They were both up in those matches. They both had chances. And they both played. I mean, they showed something in those matches, right? Who do you think feels the better of the two coming out of this? And who do you feel better about in terms of, okay, that was a real positive sign if you can take positives from a tough loss? I, I honestly personally look more at Yannick Sinner um, in terms of him being able to take more away from it. Just based off of what his results have shown in the last year, he's made two quarterfinals now this season, um, Australian Open here. He's already made the quarterfinals of the French previously in 2020. So I feel like his learning curve is 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 starting to accelerate. He's uh, trying to really um, get a lot from these matches. I know it's it's a tough loss, but Djokovic was playing at prime Djokovic level. I don't think Yannick Sinner really did much wrong from what I saw. I think it was just a matter of Djokovic finding his rhythm and just kind of figuring uh, the Yannick Sinner game out on grass. Um, so I actually like his chances going forward, what he took, takes away from this. I also like his mentality just as a player. He's a pretty down focused guy but he doesn't take you know anybody for um more than what they are I think that he kind of took it to Djokovic and I think he showed him that he's not afraid of him doesn't matter who he, who he is doesn't matter how much he's won so I like that um sort of approach for him I like what he's done in the last season um and I think that going forward he has a lot of potential uh, especially we'll see what he, what he does on the American hardcore season here in the fall um, but you know, him being the younger guy, just having maybe two years on tour, I think he started on tour in 2019. So this is really only midway through his third season on tour. Um, you know, he has a lot of room for, for, uh, uh, quite a, quite an impact. Um, I think also just for, just for the sake of Fritz, I mean, it's a quite, quite an impressive result. I don't want to go away from that, but, um, given Nadal's injury, which is definitely bothering him. If you look at just miles per hour average on the survey that he had had, 
I think that Fritz d- did what he could, but at the same time, I think there's not a, a prime Rafa Nadal. And unfortunately, every time he plays Nadal, he's not getting the best uh, version of Nadal. So I think we have to take some things with a grain of salt. Arjun, your, your thoughts on Fritz and, and Sinner? Yeah, so I think what it comes down to really is who can learn from these five set matches and handle the finish line pressure that these all these all these young ones are facing against all these big opponents deep in tournaments. And this is a topic I know we're talking about later. But who which one, Fritz or Sinner, will come out of this match and be like, I should have won that match because I'm a better player, because I can become more clutch, become get more uh, confident late in matches and adapt my game when the other person adapts against me. So when we're when we're watching Fritz versus Nadal, you saw we saw Nadal just out outsmart Fritz. And at at a at a certain level, when your IQ is so so high in tennis, it's really hard to get even like a marginal one point IQ better. And so with um with being outsmarted in that match, I don't think Fritz can really improve how how well he competes in these big matches quarterfinals semifinals and handle that semifinals uh the finish line press pressure in the fifth set against a big player in a big moment yeah he he had some in insane wins this this tournament um going deep uh against a few players um but but if if you're up a couple sets two to one and nadal and in the fifth set, he was, uh, I think he was up for a little bit as well. He, and against an uh, injured Nadal, just like Bilal said, I think um, you have to be able to finish those matches uh, when your opponent is injured. Nadal was not serving out of his mind, and he never does sat, uh, serve big uh, per se. His average serve is about 115, and he was serving 105, 100, which is, so it's a 10 point, 10 miles per hour uh, decrease, but it's not, I don't, I don't think it's a significant decrease that really changes the way he plays. So I, I think overall, although his serve was a little slower, he was probably playing around that 95, 90% percentile level that he normally plays at. And so he was really dominating uh, Fritz from the baseline, um, and, which he, and that's his game, dominating from the baseline. And Fritz, of course, had no answer for that. Um, and not many players do, so you can't really um, fault Chris for that. But for someone to learn from a match, I think Sinner, you know, he's uh, like like you said, Bilal, he's 20 years old, has uh, made a few quarterfinals now. It's his third season. He's on a quicker rise and a much more steeper rise. and has a lot more to learn from these matches. Um, he was outplayed by Djokovic. He was outskilled by Djokovic. And Djokovic just, you know, learned from Sinner's game in the first two sets and started dominating him and not even dominating him, just playing Djokovic style tennis, which Sinner and a lot of players usually don't have answers for. And, um, and, and Djokovic's, you know, uh, legendary grass court, just a uh, game that he, he doesn't, he doesn't lose in those clutch moments. He has that finish line pressure. And I think to get to a fifth set with Djokovic, it, it's a big learning opportunity that I think Sinner has now and i think moving forward in future tournaments he'll go deep in tournaments he'll continue to go deep in tournaments and i think one of these tournaments he is bound to put it all together get that mentality right and adapt to the adaptation that other opponents uh are bringing against him yeah i I love both of your points i'm gonna i'm gonna zag a little bit on center in a second but but i mean i look we talked about this before the tournament and when we talked about fa or herb cox we're like look if you guys want to win a slam you got to beat certain guys, right? Um, and it's great to get through your draw without issue, like Fritz did. Fritz won four matches in straight sets. He yep. was holding, I think, 52%. Gil Gross was saying earlier, 52% of his serves were unreturned. I mean, that's an insane stat, more than anyone in the tournament. And that's great. I'm not. I'm actually not criticizing. That's better than if he struggled through those four matches. But for him, he didn't play anyone who was projected to give him any trouble in those four rounds. And he and he benefited a little bit, right? FAA would have been his fourth round opponent. He didn't play him. Cressy took out FAA. Then he didn't have to play Cressy because Jack Sock took out Cressy. And then he didn't have to play Jack Sock 
because Jack Sock lost the round before him. And that's not his fault. He can only play who's in front of him. But my point is his tournament from like showing us something beyond started today. And he's a little different than, than Sinner in the sense he hasn't had consistent slam runs. Mm -hmm. So he can still look at the positive and say, hey, I made my first grand slam quarterfinal. I'm not a consistent guy going deep in these slams. But part of the reason he said that he kept getting stuck was because his seating was always like in that 25 to 30 range. And he's no longer in that range. He's now in that eight to 16 range where, yeah, he can get to the fourth round with a pretty good run. And if he gets lucky, he doesn't have to play anybody really notable to get to the quarters. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty broken up after the match, right? Because and you mentioned this, Arjun, like he's playing Nadal, not at his best. He showed earlier this year at Indy Wells, he can beat Nadal, not as his best. Mm -hmm. And he kind of blew it. You know, I watched most of this match. Um, and it, it's interesting. I it's, it's in a way it's better because we'll get to center in a second. He actually could have won this match. I never felt like center was going to win that match. He was center was never winning in sets three, four or five. Yeah. So basically it was like Djokovic won three straight sets and none of those sets were close. Yeah. Fritz, Fritz was in all three of these sets that he lost. Yeah. And he had pressure on a doll on all three sets. And in the fifth set, he was the one serving first. He yeah. had all the pressure on a doll and he definitely was feeling it. And, you know, I don't know. He, he also famously blew that match against Djokovic at the Australian open where he Djokovic is up two sets, pulls his ab, loses two sets. And I remember the frustration. And again, this match, I was rooting for Nadal as a non, as a biased observer. That match, I was rooting against Djokovic as a biased observer. Yeah. And I remember my frustration was the same for both sides. That match, I was like, you know, Fritz, like, he, the guy can't move side to side, right? Yeah. Djokovic yeah. just wants to stay in the middle of the court. He can't stretch out wide. You should be hitting angles. You should be slicing. You should be making him stretch that ab instead of just missing returns that you don't need to go big on. Why are you shortening the points, right? You don't look tired. And this match was the same. I was like, Nadal can't run to his backhand side and extend. He's slicing every backhand. Yeah. And he's slicing these high looping backhands. And you could step in and volley them, but you're choosing to stay back. Mm -hmm. And you're not attacking. And you keep going backhand to forehand. It's exactly what Nadal wants to do. I don't care if your backhand's really good if you're Taylor Fritz. Nadal was on fire with the forehand. I mean, that was the reason he won this match. Yeah. His forehand in the fourth and fifth set, and he barely won those sets with his forehand redlining because he, if you can't serve in tennis, you're giving up your biggest advantage. Every port starts at neutral, and Nadal is arguably the greatest neutral point player in the history of the game, mm -hmm. given that he never has a great serve to begin with. But I guess my point is I look at Sinner and I say, why did he lose that match? Djokovic obviously played awesome, but Djokovic adjusted his strategy and said, basically said, I'm not going to give you any forehands. Everything's going in the backhand. I'm going to show you that I have a slice. I'm going to hit angles and I'm just going to test your backhand. And Sinner's big deficiency, I think, is it's a little bit rube levy, but I think he has a better potential. Yeah. His two biggest weaknesses, he's not dominant on surf. So mm -hmm. he is not somebody you trust to keep holding because he's not, he's getting better, but he's still not a guy who routinely holds his serve. And his second issue is really a lack of the variety, the slice, the chip, yeah. the volleys. I mean, this is why we really didn't have Sinner going deep. We had no expectations for him. He had never won a grass match. I look at Sinner, I say, this is a real turning point, not just because of the Djokovic match. He beat Wawrinka in the first round in four sets. He beat Isner after Isner beat Murray. And he took out Alcaraz. And Alcaraz wasn't awesome in that match, but Alcaraz played pretty well. And that was a good quality match. That was a big win for Sinner, right? Like, I think mentally. Yeah. I think Sinner, the real question is, do you think Sinner has it in him, right? So, like, I look at Sinner, and I'm like, the real tipping point for him, is he going to be like Burdich, where he looks awesome side to side against someone who doesn't have a plan B? But yeah. if he plays somebody like a Djokovic or a Nadal or down the line, Alcaraz develops in that type of guy who has that variety, who throws junk at him, who throws in the wide balls, who gives him different spins. Does he have the ability to learn how to hit a good slice? Does he have the ability to come to net and not blow volleys? Like he doesn't, I, he doesn't seem to have a naturally amazing hands. Mm -hmm. It seems like, and that was Burdich's biggest problem besides yeah. lateral movement. Sinner is a better lateral mover. But his biggest issue, I look at Sinner, is like, yeah, serve hopefully will get better as he gets older. I think he's a hard worker. Like, there's nothing really wrong with his serve. It should be better for his height. He's like 6'4". But the variety, like, can he handle yeah. variety? 
Yeah. Fritz, I look at him, and I've never been that high on Taylor Fritz simply because I view him as somebody he's known to have a great serve. But in these big matches, not like he's holding serve left and right. I mean, he got broken seven times in this match, I think. I mean, like, mm -hmm. he he is – he doesn't – Nadal was returning a lot of these serves. Like, he doesn't – and even that Djokovic match, he's not dominant on serve the way, like, Kyrgios or Opelka or Isner are, right? Like, or even Djokovic at his best or Federer at his best. He's a good server, but I think his serve is overrated because he hits it really hard, but he doesn't necessarily hit his spots. And then I think he's really solid off the ground. His backhand is really pretty. His forehand can be big. He doesn't strike me as an awesome athlete. And, it, it, and Bilal, I don't know if you agree, but like these low balls, Nadal was just chipping and blunting and Fritz doesn't want to come in because he doesn't trust his volleys. He doesn't have a slice that he trusts to come in off of. I don't know if he's going to develop that. And I think that's why he was kind of broken up after this match, because I don't think like Sinner can look ahead and say, look, this is probably my worst surface. And I got to the quarters and I took two sets yeah. off Djokovic and, you know, I could beat him on clay or, or hard if I play like this. Fritz looks at this and Fritz is like, I'm never going to get something open up for me like this for a long time. Maybe like no Berrettini, no Medvedev, mm -hmm. no Zverev, no Chilich, right? <laughs> no, injured Nadal. And Kyrgios is going to be my semi-opponent. And I can win that match. He's a terrible returner. And then I'm in the finals of Wimbledon. And, and like, I think, I don't think he just got tight. I just think he doesn't have it in him. And Nadal showed the IQ that he and Djokovic show in these matches. They know exactly the shots to play and when to play them below. Yeah. I, you know, a couple of things. I think, number one, uh, I saw something interesting. Uh, some One of the pundits was saying that, should this, you know, had both of these matches been a uh, best of three, these guys would have won, you know? And I think it's true. I mean, you, that's kind of the beauty of the best of five still. I know it's debated whether we should continue having that in tennis. And I think this kind of shows why these two matches do reflect like what can happen, especially against these legends. The other thing is that I think Nadal has, I mean, it goes without saying, but he has really mastered how to win when he's hurt. Like, you know, we, we give him grief or he, he's given himself a lot of grief actually for just his injuries in the past, how much has limited him and his potential and grand slams and, and whatnot. But I think his panic button is just lower in general because he's just become accustomed to having this threshold to know how to, what to do with every type of injury it looks like. Uh, it feels like he's always getting an abdominal injury of some kind and it seems like it happens pre-match, mid-match or something. But knowing what to rely on in those moments, I think is kind of a, a sign of someone who knows how to adjust. And we've talked about this previously here on this podcast about how, you know, knowing how to, you know, Nadal knows the tactical side of things probably better than most others. And it's kind of underrated has his ability to do that, uh, especially when um, not playing at his best. But, you know, credit to him to finding the, the target on the forehand today is what saved him clearly. We'll see if he plays on uh, on Friday. Fingers yeah. crossed, you will, because I'm I'm more excited to talk about what's come down the road. Yeah, yeah. I just have but, one more comment about Fritz. Uh, uh, Jay, you mentioned how he he also doesn't have too much variety. His, his serve is big, but not too big. He, he also he doesn't come to the net often. He he's kind of he's hit he's past puberty now, so he's like kind of the biggest he'll ever be. Sinner, on the other hand. He's not done with puberty. So he, he could still grow maybe another inch or two. Sinner is definitely done with puberty from a medical yeah. standpoint. <laughs> You're uh, saying Sinner, from, Sinner hasn't filled out. You're saying Sinner he hasn't filled Sinner out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's, he's, he's, he's a lot more to grow. Fritz, I think, has reached his peak in that. But Fritz is kind of turning out to be – I'm wondering if he's turning out to be a typical American-style tennis player. Big serve, big forehand, good he's ground good. strokes. He's put nothing at the net, no variety, and no, no real oh, knee bend. Weapon. You know, I, I know this is going to – I feel like he has the weapons. I also think mentally – and this isn't a criticism. I don't think he's mentally weak at all. I think he's a, he's a tough player. He won Indian Wells. He won Eastbourne. Mm -hmm. I just don't think he has that extra gear mentally that some of these top guys got. And that's not a criticism. Not everyone has that. But I compare him, like, I saw him play Brooksby at the Open last year. Mm -hmm. I think Brooksby has way less in terms of actual physical weapons compared to Fritz. Shouldn't be hanging with him. Fr Brooksby took him to the cleaners in the sense he took all the close sets. Like, I'm really high on Jensen Brooksby simply because mentally I saw something from him. I'm like, well, this guy knows. Like, we were just talking about Nadal and Djokovic. Like, you talked about managing injuries, but well, it's just knowing what's your plan B, what's your plan C, and – we're not going to turn this into a big three kind of discussion, but like for me, I always felt like 
Federer was amazing at that. Nadal and Djokovic were better at that because they had to be better at that because their plan A doesn't always work. And I thought that was true for both of them as a young age in retrospect. You know, Nadal in 05, he won everything in sight. He wasn't the player he was now. He couldn't hit all the shots he can hit now, but he would figure out ways to win these matches, right? And Djokovic, I remember 07 Wimbledon. Everyone was like, this guy was good on clay. He won Miami. He's not going to do anything on grass. And he really struggled. But he won like four close matches in a row. It felt like every time he needed like a close ball, he beat Kiefer. He beat Hewitt. He beat Baghdadis. And finally lost to Nadal in retirement. But like all these matches, I remember watching the guys, like he kept pulling these matches out of his butt. No, you know, and it part of it is like some people just have that it. They know what it is they have to do in those moments. I don't think all these guys have. And so let's get into the discussion, like best of five, right? I, I mean, we all think best of five should stay in the slams. They used to have best of five outside the slams more, right? Davis Cup and Master Finals, those went away. Um, but Djokovic didn't really benefit from that, right? So Djokovic, he won the last best of five final, which was Miami 07. He won in straight sets. It wasn't like it gave him reps for a five-set match. Mm-hmm. Nadal won a couple of big five setters when actually three, he won three five set master finals in a fifth set tie break. Coria in 05 Rome, Federer 06 Rome, and Madrid 05 on indoor hard against Lubicic. So Nadal got some of those reps. But the point is, look at their five set records, right? Djokovic, they showed the stat before the center match. He's 37 and 10 now after the center match in five set matches. Nadal is 26 and 13 in five set matches. And then Fritz, I mean, has a handful of matches. Sinner was two and two entering that match. Like, do you think, Bilal, that this contributes to that? Like, so let's think about all these five-set matches. It's been really rare for a young player to take a five-set match. I'm going to give you a ton of examples. Team in 2018 loses to Nadal at the U.S. Open. Team in 2020 loses to Djokovic Australian Open. To be fair to him, he did beat him in a fifth set at Roland Garros in 2019. Zverev, U.S. Open last year against Djokovic, couldn't win a fifth set. Medvedev this year at the Australian Open, couldn't win the fifth set. Tsitsipas last year at the Roland Garros, couldn't win the fifth set. Felix, you know, Grady got to the fifth set at Roland Garros, couldn't win the fifth set. Now we have Fritz and Sinner. Like, we would expect the younger player at some point to have the advantage in these matches. It doesn't seem, though, like, like is it, it, how much of it is these guys are that good? and Or how much of it is that these young guys just – don't know what to do in those fifth sets. Like, what is it if you had to sign percentages? I don't know. I, I guess it's not, you know, I would say maybe it's 20%, 30% lack of experience. I wouldn't even chalk it up to maybe more. Yeah, I feel maybe that's even too high. I don't think it's like the, the Davis Cup matches in the past or the the, the, the Masters having the finals that were actually uh, best of five or as the rest of the term is best of three. I don't think those experiences really are what made, you know, the big three guys really dominant in these um best of five situations i think it's just a matter of the mentality i think the ma- the matches that you mentioned are up against some of the greats so it's not easy i mean you look at it since pass against Federer in 2000 what was it 19 uh i guess uh australian open i mean that was a that to me i mean at that time everyone was like oh this is changing the guard this is like the new guy and the next generation is here they've arrived and so you have those pockets of where these guys have shown their their the signs of them being able to close Medvedev us open won yep. the final yeah exactly so i, I guess that there's 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 signs of them learning, but I guess at the end of the day too, it's so case by case in, in each match that I'm not sure if there's really a, it's so hard to put a, put a number on it. I'm not sure exactly what it is with these guys, but I think it's just a matter of the player themselves and, and who they are and who they're playing against. You know, if you put Medvedev against Sitsi Pass in best of five, I, I have no, I flip a coin every time, but if it's against Djokovic, I'm going to give it to Djokovic, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, I've got a similar mindset with as that. I think, um, based on if it's the big two, big three, like they, they really beat you on the will to win and figuring out a way to win in the fifth set. And we've seen it, I mean, time and time again with Nadal, Djokovic, Federer, even Murray, and uh, some of the uh, other people who have won slams um, uh, in the 2010s. Um, everyone's gone five sets and they've had to. I'm sure, I feel like it's been every slam, like they've had to win five sets to win a slam uh, at some point in the tournament. Um, that, that would be a really interesting stat to look up. But uh, all of these young players, I'm sure they have the will to win, but I don't think they have the will to adapt to a fourth set, to a fifth set. And once, when they're, and especially late in the match, if you win the fourth set, 
then your opponent is going to change what they're doing in the fifth set. And at three all in the fifth set, can you change what you're doing again? I think that's really hard for a lot of players to do. Uh, we were just saying Federer did it really well and Djokovic and Nadal did it really um, like much even better because they had to, and they had a lot more tools in their toolkit. They had so many different options to, to, to slice, to volley, to serve better, to hit, play longer points, to shorten up points, to flatten out shots, to hit more spin. Uh, a lot of these players, I feel like, don't have that variety and don't have the, I don't know if it's courage or, yeah, it might be courage. It might be like the 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 will to the will to be clutch. Honestly, I think Kyrgios is someone that has it. I was looking at his, um, well, I was looking at his uh, tiebreak record actually, which is overall pretty good. Um, Ten and six this year, and sixteen and eight in deciding tiebreaks. He's very positive in his lifetime. One hundred and ten over sixty two. So. I don't know his uh, fifth set record actually, but I want six and zero at Wimbledon. He hasn't played a ton of five set or six played. and zero at Wimbledon in five set matches. Although he hasn't really, yeah, it's a curious like he hasn't really beaten anyone really notable in those five sets. But he is really good in the fifth set at Wimbledon. But I I think the same thing stands against whoever you're playing. If you're playing uh, someone like Opelka, he Opelka has a pretty straightforward game or Isner. In the fifth set, they're going to keep playing the same tennis that they play. Mm. But I feel like Kyrgios will change his game. I don't see Sinner. I don't see Fritz really adapting. Yeah. And I guess that that's my theme of this tournament is like the players who adapt and move on and, yeah. and uh, naturally evolve and select themselves to win versus the ones who don't. Um, yeah. yeah I, I, I forgot how much I missed watching good grass tennis because yeah, yeah. the thing that's really cool about it those low dipping short balls or those slices that those slices can na it's really nasty to deal with. And like you, Nadal and Djokovic underrated defensive slices, right? They do a really good job. They get a lot of air on those balls, right? And they yeah. angle them. So they're hard to pick off in the air. So like passing shots. Yeah. And then they do that 360 sort of spin as they hit it. So yeah. they get themselves right back in position afterward. Yeah. And it's like, and it's interesting. They, they know they, and Djokovic referenced this in his presser afterward. He talked about, because it's like, what do you think would happen to Sinner? He's like, you know, I think he realized that the pressure was on him. And I don't think that's fully why Sinner lost. I actually thought Djokovic oh. sort of just relaxed. But but in a way, Djokovic and Nadal play with that a little bit. Like, you look at that Djokovic match. He's 4-2 up in the fifth. He's up a break. You're like, okay, the match is over. But he still had to serve that out. And they can still get nervous serving things out. So he really pressed for that second break. Mm -hmm. And the way he did it, wasn't by going for broke. He was just getting extra balls in the court. He yeah. has that backhand that's gone viral, which he hit like this crazy sprawling backhand at the airplane pose. But at that point was set up. He dug out a tough return. He just blocked it back in the corner. That block return, we want Sitsi Pass and everyone else to get. And then he hit that amazing backhand on the run. And mentally, it just fried center. He just dumped a horrible swinging forehand. Like he had an open forehand volley and just missed yeah. it by like six feet, right? Because the mental part of it, they're playing with that mental part of it. Nadal did the same thing for, to Fritz late in that fourth set. He was just like, okay, Fritz, I'm going to hit every ball, a loop high ball, go for it. Go for it. I know, he, he knows Fritz is going to be nervous. So he's like, I'm daring you to pull the trigger right now. One of these, if you hit it, more yeah. power to you. But you're going to have to hit three or four of these winners in a row, knowing that it's 30 all, five all in the fourth, and you're about to get broken. And, and I think they... Pull, we it's so basic the all these pros know the the, the scoring of tennis we've talked about it. the scoring is you got to win games you put together games to win sets to win matches but these guys i think djokovic is even the most workman like about it where he's like i just need the break okay i'm gonna get the break i'm gonna roll through my service games and he goes if you notice he serves faster when he's up yeah his tempo goes up because yeah. he doesn't want the other player to catch on his service motion and he wants to keep putting pressure on them so he yeah. goes quicker and he demands the ball and then on the other hand, when it's close, he'll take his time on his serve, right? He settles himself. And I think Nadal, too, there's like, okay, we saw in the shop of ball of match Australia. He's like, I don't have much in the tank. I'm going to push really hard for the break right here. And then I'm just going to save all my energy for my service games. Yeah. Um, and, and you saw it on the fifth set. It was very similar. I thought that tiebreak at the end to the Djokovic-Nadal tiebreaker at um, Roland Garros. Um, he just went for his forehand. Anytime he got a forehand, he just went for it. He's just like, okay, I'm going to win or lose if I hit this forehand. So let's look ahead, right? You mentioned Kyrgios. A couple of Nadal stats we'll throw out heading into that match. Um, he does have an abdominal injury. Those are not good for tennis in general. Basically, every shot is affected by it. Especially Nadal. You know what's going to 
happen. There's it, the range of possibilities is he gets an MRI tomorrow and they say you shouldn't play and he retires. His father and sister were both telling him to retire and he refused because he's a stubborn, you know, SOB. And that's part of the greatness and also the badness of being Rafa Nadal's family member, probably. Um, but he could he could pull out. He could play and see how it goes for a set or two and pull out. Or he could be fine. You know, Djokovic pulled his abdominal muscle in Australia. I was looking back to see who he played. He played Milos Raonic the next round, one and four. Kyrgios is not exactly the most physically taxing player to play. It's a lot of short points, a lot of serves. He's not a great returner. Nadal is now 37 and 34 in Grand Slam matches when he loses the first set. Djokovic is 42 and 39. And that is impressive. They're losing the first set and they're still winning more than half those matches. Nadal now has won double the number of the next person, fifth set tiebreakers in five set matches. So of course he's going to feel more comfortable and it gets there with any, against anyone really yeah. when he gets to a fifth set tiebreak. He plays Kyrgios. Kyrgios had that really memorable match below against Tsitsipas, who isn't exactly a, a world beater on grass. He has had two five setters, first round against Jub, fourth round, struggled through Nakashima. Garin was not a tough draw. He benefited probably more than anyone from RBA not being there as his fourth round opponent. Yeah. Which, that was the round he struggled against Nakashima. RBA is like a souped up Nakashima, probably mm -hmm. would have lost. Didn't have to play Berrettini in the quarters, right? So he comes in pretty fresh here, Bilal. Clearly, it meant a lot to him. I think he's always pretended he didn't care. I think he cares a lot. Yep. My, my question for you, Djokovic is the heavy, heavy favorite against Cam Nori. Who does Novak want to play on Sunday if he had to pick? You know, that's a good question. I think, I think he has, I think I've hinted at this last time too, or Joker just kind of insinuated that maybe these Nadal injuries are not as, as, um, as a real. serious as they appear, as serious as they appear, right? So I think for him, he's, he's always scared of an Nadal creep up on him, Nadal creeping up more in a serious situation, such as a, you know, Grand Slam final, right? I mean, this is a guy who, has won 22 majors for a reason in a year where he's not even been at his healthiest. So I'm sure Djokovic would be a little relieved if uh, Nadal pulls out, but I think he's just as, um, not just as afraid, but he also, he would not be sleeping easy knowing that Kyrgios is, is uh, Sunday's final, uh, if, if he's the opponent for the final on Sunday. So tough to say, um, you know, I, if I had to pick one though, I think, I think he would prefer Nadal right now the reason I say that is because of the injury and I think that Kyrgios for him still not having found a solution Kyrgios always plays well as the underdog I think that's how what he prefers if based off his post uh post-match press conference today too he was just saying that you know I think I felt a little tired against Nakashima against Garin because I'm, I'm supposed to win these matches and everybody thinks it's gonna be easy for me and these matches have been tough so I think Kyrgios uh, you know takes a takes a breath of relief and 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 stretch firing away on Sunday. So I'm sure that would actually scare Djokovic more. Arjun, you're Novak Djokovic. You're a 34 year old Serbian dominator. You're not afraid of anyone. I mean, we're not, I don't think Djokovic, Djokovic yeah. probably say he doesn't care, but, but truth serum, do you agree? Would you, would you want Nick or Nadal? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, you know, I, I'm looking at my, my legacy as a whole too, and beating Kyrgios in a final doesn't sound right doesn't sound right when you're, you're when you're coming when you're in a Wimbledon final it doesn't sound right so for my legacy I want to beat Nadal um right after he won two grand slams and and show that I am still the dominant player on grass and uh, I'm still one of the top two players this year and uh arguably uh the one of the top two players of all time uh he's not going to get that clout beating beating Kyrgios. Kyrgios and I think he's a he may be a little scared of Kyrgios with Kyrgios being as streaky as he is he's on fire right now no even he's ha had some close matches but uh he's rolled past uh the, uh the last one he's he's on he's on a he's on a roll right now so he he can do some damage I think mentally he can get the crowd behind him and he can really and even though Djokovic thrives on negative energy he, he doesn't, I don't think he'll thrive against Kyrgios's negative energy at him or uh, with the crowd supporting Kyrgios. He, he, he loves playing against Nadal, I think, because the crowd supports Nadal always. And he's used to that, the Nadal chance and um, the Serbian people who support him uh, against Nadal. But yeah, so I, I think 
the the match is for Djokovic to beat Nadal, uh, and 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 Nadal he wants the injury, he wants the the, the challenge of beating Nadal, getting him closer to twenty one versus twenty two. Um, so I, I I'll go I'll, I'd rather play Nadal. But you're not yeah, afraid. Of, it, that's Nadal not being afraid of Kyrgios. So you're saying that he wants Nadal, but he's also afraid of Nadal. I think he wants Nadal. And I don't think he wants Kyrgios because I, I think he has a lot more to lose to lo- uh, by mm. losing Kyrgios. He also has a lot more to. Uh, you think he'd rather he'd rather be not? He wouldn't want to be the heavy favorite against Nick Kyrgios in center court. You're yeah. Saying. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 I mean, let's talk about nerves. We talked about before the tournament. We were like, because we did our picks before the tournament, right? I picked Djokovic. Um, oh, Nadal, right. you picked yeah. Nadal. Um, you know, Arjun, it will give you a, a mulligan because you picked Berrettini. And who knows, you know, but Berrettini, I, again, this is all projection. Curious has been awesome. I probably would have picked a healthy Matteo Berrettini to win that quarter, yeah. given what we saw. And I probably would pick him over Nadal if Nadal's hurting. Or if Nadal's healthy, then you can argue it back and forth. Nadal, like, but Berrettini's not there. And, and Bilal, you brought up the point about nerves. You said, you know, I think if it comes down to Nadal versus Djokovic, Nadal is going to be loose. Djokovic is going to be tight mm-hmm. because of the pressure. He hadn't looked particularly tight. I mean, he's he, the one thing I'll say about Djokovic is really hard to poke holes in him because he looks awesome on grass when he looks good. Yeah. He's not taking the backhand up the line that much. Um, he hasn't been forced to by anyone. Mm-hmm. But like last year against Berrettini, when he was nervous, we talked about this before, he went back to old reliable. He would just go back into backhand cross court until Berrettini missed. Mm-hmm. Um, and he can't do that against Nadal, right? So he knows how to play against Nadal, but that's death against Nadal. I, I just feel bad that Nadal's not going to get to that final 100% likely. If he was 100%, I think it would be 50-50. Yeah. If you can't win free points on serve against Novak Djokovic on grass, you aren't going to win the match because he's going to get so many free points on his own serve. Mm. I, I would say if I'm Novak, I'm obviously leery of Nadal injury history. But as of tonight, I'm looking at those two matches and be like, I kind of don't want Kyrgios. I agree. Yeah. I don't want the smoke. Like. The real question is nerves. Like, I don't think Nadal, we've seen him get nervous, but I feel like he would go into the final and he'd be like, Djokovic is favored. He's won the last three. I haven't been here in many years. I have 22. I'm hurt. He would find all these mental ways. I don't think he would be super nervous. Djokovic, it's really hard to tell where his head's at a lot, but I think he could be nervous. I think the crowd would support Nadal. Have we seen Nick Kyrgios ever get tight? We haven't. But part of it is because he doesn't really go deep. This is his first Grand Slam semi. Mm. I'm really curious. I would, I mean, we talked about it before the tournament. I was like, my ideal result is Kyrgios gets to the final and loses. Now, I don't want Djokovic to win. So I, my ideal result, Kyrgios right. gets to the final and win if he gets there. But I'm just really curious if he has to step up and serve out Wimbledon, is he the type of guy who gets tight? Or is he the type of guy because he goes so fast that he just breezes through that service game like it's nothing? He strikes me, everything about the way he carries himself, Bilal, it strikes me as someone who I don't give a crap. I'm going to just come out. But I don't know if that's actually true. And we're going to find out in the next two matches, is that just his image he does to protect himself? Or is he actually that loose that he can just go out there and do what he does? Because I honestly think that is a tough player to play if the grass is playing fast because yeah, 100%. he gives you zero rhythm. He's basically like playing Isner or Opelka. Mm-hmm. But he's better than both those guys. His hands are better. He's got better groundies. He's more unpredictable. He doesn't lose sets because he gets tight. He loses sets because he loses focus or he starts, you know, cursing out the lines women or whatever. I'm really curious, Bilal, what you think. Do you think he gets tight if he's in a scenario to beat either of these guys? I actually don't. Uh, and that's it's, it sounds insane to say that. Like this guy, you know, he's never even won a Masters 1000. Can he serve out a Grand Slam? But the thing is that, he just, it's its like you said, he just carries himself in that way that you kind of just see him being the, the guy that rises up because he doesn't care. Not because he's like, all right, it's time to claim what's mine. It's kind of like for him, for him, it's like, well, uh, I have nothing to lose. I'll, I'll serve it out. doesn't matter to me. I get the W. This guy has to live with it. You know, he's kind of of that mindset. What's kind of crazy to me is that one, Djokovic in this tournament, in this tournament has said in the, in the press that, you know, Kyrgios has probably the, one of the best serves, not just currently in the game, but ever. overall and ever, yeah. ever in tennis. That says something to me. I mean, that that was probably premature because he didn't think there's a possibility of playing in the final, but I think that kind of speaks to well, giving some, some confidence too. 
I also don't think he sees that serve that often, right? He only played him twice in 2017. He sure. lost both his matches. Yeah. I don't think he broke him in either match. Yeah. I really doubt Kyrgios practices with Djokovic ever. No, absolutely no chance. Right? They don't have a good relationship. They're not friends. He yeah. probably never sees it. I think with those big servers, it's all about seeing the serve a decent number of times. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I would equate like Berrettini last year harder in some ways because I think he's got a better forehand than Kyrgios. His serve isn't as good, but it's almost as good. Mm -hmm. But and he's mentally a rock where Kyrgios maybe isn't always engaged. But at least Djokovic, when he was nervous, could always go to the back end. The Kyrgios back end is not awesome. Like it's I think it's good. It's not like amazing, but it's it's not like a weakness that you can just throw powder puff balls to it all day. He has good hand, he's a good slice, he's got good volleys. Um, he likes entertaining. Um, I mean, let's get to our picks. I mean, we're, we're wrapping up here, but like it's really hard in the context. So the bookies have Djokovic as the heavy, heavy favorite to win Wimbledon, mm -hmm. um, which makes sense because they, they have Cam Nori at like 37 to 1 to win Wimbledon. So they're essentially telling you, like we all think, that Djokovic is the heavy favorite against Nori. So he really only has to beat one of those dudes. Um, but then you have Kyrgios and Nadal, and they have Kyrgios as the slight favorite because I think they don't know what to do with the injury. They're like, well, yeah, if they were both healthy, probably Nadal's favorite, but Nadal could pull out tomorrow and then the bets are scrapped. Um, what do you think is going to happen, Arjun, in the next three days, if you had to predict? Before I go any further, I want to give an honorable mention out to Cam Nori. He's yeah, like, fair. He <laughs> he, I was watching uh, highlights of his match. He was, you know, when, when I talk about adaptability, he was standing way far behind the baseline against Go, uh, Goffin uh, or in, early in the match. And then I'm looking at the fourth and fifth sets, and he's finishing so many points at the net. So, you know, I, I don't think this is a big favorite for Djokovic to win. Uh, just like me, like just uh, just looking at him play uh, his last match. I, I think this is a tougher match for Djokovic uh, than interesting than, than Djokovic has against Sinner. And tough, think, tough. Do you think he's going to drop a set? Uh, I think it. it, it, it I think it's going to go five sets. Um, wow. Oh, wow. Going to go five That's sets. Two. I know last time they played uh, Djokovic. Six beat one him. six two. Six <laughs> one six two. Steamroll. Yeah. But I think the the way I watched uh, the, the the way the way he played Gopin, pulling him off the court, he's he's honestly playing very similar to Nadal, pulling pulling his opponents off the court to his uh, to their backhand with his lefty forehand, and then really flattening out the backhands cross court or uh, down the line uh, to the open court uh, a lot and coming in a lot. And he's good at the net. He's crafty at the net. So I, I want to give him a good shout out there and give him a little more respect than. Um, yeah, uh, than he's getting. Um, but still, I, I think uh, Djokovic, uh, you know, rightly so, like he, he's earned his, uh, his, his spot in the finals um, just ba based on his history. Uh, I think he'll win uh, the match overall. Um, and, you know, I, I think this next match, I don't think Nadal loses based on uh, injury, I think, um, or, or wins uh, uh, based on uh, how, how, well, he's playing. I think it's, I think it's Kyrgios's match to lose. Um, I don't see any long points. I don't see uh, like a taxing match. I think if Kyrgios keeps his mind right, then he can beat Nadal here. Um, but if he if he's mentally not with it for the four or five sets that is going to go, then um, then I, I think it's uh, Nadal's match uh, to win. Um, so if I if I had to fl uh, flip a coin or put money on it. I'm going Nadal based on mental willpower, mental strength, and having the history of getting to finals and uh, winning these sorts of matches that, that make him legendary and make him uh, a top a one, top two player of all time. So I think it's going to be another Djokovic-Nadal final. And? And, and uh, that's, a, that's a kicker. I think uh, with uh, this injury, Djokovic is going to win, unfortunately. All right, uh, Bilal, what do you think? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Kyrgios or Nadal at this point, uh, and I'm gonna go Kyrgios for the win. I think. Wow. I think, uh, I think it's gonna happen. I think I. Uh, in, in respect to Cam Nori, but I don't see him really getting uh, farther than he's gotten. But I think it'll be nice to see the crowd give him some support. We'll see if he can. To, I think he'll. I'll get a set. I'll, I'll give Djokovic goes gets through in four. But I think Kyrgios uh, rises up to the occasion. I've been impressed with him. I think we've been talking about it throughout the grass course season that he has a real chance and he's made it this far and it's kind of like a it's gonna be interesting to see what he can do but i think i respect um, that but if, i feel like if nadal plays 
Kyrgios, the just the same way he played Fritz, you know, just grinding know. out those. He's not going to break him as much. Though. Grinding out those yeah. baseline points, I think. Seven that, breaks. That's, that's the thing. Seven breaks. There's going to be fewer of those points though. Fritz, Fritz is. This is what we're saying. Fritz isn't. I mean, his unreturn was rate was very high, but you have to look at who he played. Yeah. Um. He I, again. I've never been impressed with these matches. He, I think he's not on the same level serve wise. Agreed. Um, Kyrgios arguably has the best serve on tour. It's either him, Opelka, or Isner, right? It's got to be one of yeah. those three guys. And it's really only because of his toss, because no one can read it. And I think that's what frustrates Djokovic the most, because he reads so well that I don't see yeah. him. For, I mean, if, if Kyrgios is focused, I think Sunday he can. He has a really. really <laughs> it's a big if. It's if. It's if. a big if. if. I, I don't. If, if Nadal plays his, like, he's, like like we said though, like his injury is not really harming. His serve is not really taking away from his game because he never really. Like, he's getting fewer. Oh, his serve is way lower though. Like his yeah, he's not getting as many free points. Like that was the other thing we didn't talk about for Fritz is an adjustment. Fritz was getting torched by the Nadal. Nadal was basically old manning him on the serve game. I mean, it was he was serving routinely ninety five to one hundred five miles an hour. These slice spins, kickers like Djokovic is going to eat that for breakfast if they if he's still at that level. Oh yeah, Djokovic for sure. Kyrgios, you know, Kyrgios is a bad returner. I mean, he's not a great returner, but he can have games where he just hits three or four great returns and breaks. He's not Karlovich or Isner where he's hopeless. Yeah. Um, I think this, I think that, I think there's like a 25% chance Nadal doesn't play this match. I know that sounds high. I think that there's a chance he just, his team basically comes to him. They say, hey, look, you tried playing in Indian Wells with a rib injury. If you beat Alcaraz within the rib injury, you shouldn't have played that final. You lost the match anyway. You were out for weeks, and your French Open prep was messed up because, and yeah, you won the French Open, but it's not worth it at this point. You're not winning this tournament if you're not able to serve well. And you don't get an extra day to rest. You have one day off for Friday and then another day off for Sunday against Djokovic. And I think as much as he hates it, if his doctor tells him to pack it up, he might pack it up. If he plays... I think that match goes, I would say Kyrgios in four would be my pick. You know, I think that it will come down to tie breaks. And I think even at good health, I think he's a tough match for Nadal. He's taken him to four sets twice. And the, a lot of those sets went to tie breaks. Nadal won all of them, but tie breaks are a toss up, honestly, with his serve. Mm -hmm. It's really hard for me to deviate from Djokovic in the final. I don't think Nori's getting a set. I don't think Nori's wins enough free points to get a set. I think Djokovic would take him out in four. I think it'd be very similar to last year. He loses the first set in a tie break. Kyrgios loses it a little bit. I, my problem is I do think Kyrgios gets nervous. And I think the way he exhibits his nerves is he takes it out on his box. He takes it out on other people. He doesn't get nervous. by he, he just he, And then he can blame it on that later. And be like, well, I lost my focus because the linesman did this or that. Yeah. I, I just, he's going to do something like that at some point. He would, this would be one of the greatest stories in yeah. the history of tennis. If Nick Kyrgios, who not even deviant legal thing, he's got this huge legal battle for domestic violence that's like over his head right now. He's two years of jail. But I mean, it would be a crazy story if he somehow wins Wimbledon. And then he doesn't get any ranking points for it. So he's still not seated for the rest of the hardcore season if he plays or US Open. So like um, it would be very funny, but he would have to beat Nadal and Djokovic back to back to do it unless Nadal pulls out. I don't see it. Now, if Nadal pulls out and Kyrgios doesn't play Friday, mm. I think that match on Sunday is a total toss-up because I think a lot of players get affected by not playing and messes up the rhythm. Kyrgios is not a rhythm player. He would oh, love to have the day off, rest his shoulder, and come out Sunday and just bang down serves all day. And I think he would be in much better shape. I don't think his stamina and physicality will be helped by a tough, mentally grueling match with Nadal. But if he gets the match off, I think he could totally beat one of them in a match. I just don't think he can beat both of them back to back from a mm. mental perspective. Um, and I, 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 again, I think Djokovic would not want to play him. I, I yeah. think he would not. That is probably if you toss them on the tour, the two guys he didn't want to play in the final, it would probably be Nadal and Kyrgios, right? Um, and I think Kyrgios is just, I think mentally, just knowing he's never broken the guy, I think it would be about the, that mental barrier. Like, can I get this guy's serve back enough to break him? Mm -hmm. And Djokovic has been awesome against Sinner in those last three sets. He was really good against Reithoven in the last two sets, but the roof's not going to be closed. Mm -hmm. It's going to be outdoors. It's going to be hot on Sunday. Perfect Nadal conditions, but also perfect for Kyrgios for his serve to kick up and for the ball to kick up for him to hit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's my pick. Yeah. That's, they're, they're, they're both respectable picks, but all right, we'll, we'll see how it goes.
I hedged. I picked I, two scenarios. So it, it's Djokovic if they play the semi. If they don't play the semi, I'm picking Kyrgios to win it all. I, I um, think we'll it's 100%. Out. I think 100% Nadal plays the, the semis. He, he's, I think he's a very rarely he's ever pulled out before a match, right? Uh, I don't know. I think this is rough. I, I have a feeling this injury is like a lot worse than we think, maybe. It's been going on the whole tournament, and I think this match maybe exacerbated it. I mean, he was. I mean, he took some NSAIDs, I think, at some point. Yeah. And, and now we get into the medicine part of it. And I think he suppressed the pain, but he was not, after the second set, able to really... He hit some big serves on the fifth set. I think maybe the adrenaline got him through there yeah. a little bit. And also, but I, I don't think it's going to feel good tomorrow. Do I we know? Is it, is it a, a, is it an ab muscle or a rib injury? We don't know. It's, it's no. a lower ab injury based on where he's getting okay. taped and where he's referring oh, to. Yeah. So that's like a lower ab into like your like inguinal area, like those lower obliques. Yeah. Mm. Like, so the good, good, good thing about that, it, it, I don't think those really affect your, I mean, you need your abs, but like uh, for every shot, but I don't think they really it didn't affect his forehand. I'll tell you that. <laughs> that his from forehand, my, he was hitting 100 mile per hour. Yeah. From my experience, an ab injury doesn't hurt my, for, my uh, forehand or backhand, but it does affect your serve, just like that stretching motion going backwards. Well, you could see it. Uh, Chris, Fritz had a couple points where he was smart. Where he threw up lobs to, when Nadal was in the net. Nadal was not, I mean, he was holding back. He, he was basically yeah. slicing the lobs back, the overheads back. He was not cracking them. Yeah. Mm. I, I just think, that, but he is dangerous. Titsi Pass said this after the French Open. He said Nadal is more dangerous when he's hurt. Yeah. Mm. And I do think that it's, he's not better when he's hurt. But I do think, like, we know this, and you guys will know this when you do surgery. Like, it's not good to be tired when you see patients who do surgery. But sometimes being like a little bit, like if you've done something so many times, it almost like focuses you more yeah. if you're a little bit off. Like you're just like, okay, I just need to focus down. And I think he was so hyper-focused. He was really good. Mm -hmm. He didn't miss any shots. That it, I don't think he had any room to even feel tight. Like he, if he missed a shot, it's because he went for it and he just missed it. He was not missing shots like, oh man, he just dumped that forehand in the bottom of the net. Like, he was going for it. And if he missed it, he was going for it again. And I think in a way, it's almost like a wounded animal. It's a little dangerous to play him when he's playing like that. Yeah. Because I think he just gets more unpredictable. And he I, we'll I, see. I that that's a real that's a real uh, effect, I think, because uh in my experience, uh I have a, a couple of funny stories for you after. But um yeah, no, I, I agree. Wow. We'll find out. We'll be back Sunday to talk about the results. Hopefully, um, uh, Maybe Cam Nori will win and we'll have a Sunday to talk about poor Cam Nori, 37 to one in the London bookies right now. I'm putting, I'm putting um, $10 on him. Well, you know, <laughs> that's why they play. We've gotten really spoiled by the big three, right? Yeah. They win the matches they're supposed to win. They don't lose these matches, but nothing is a given, right? God forbid Djokovic could come out and he could pull something yeah. or Nori could just get hot and Djokovic could tighten up. I mean, it wouldn't be the greatest. I mean, Nori's the top 10 seed. It's not like it's a, monster upset if he wins the match but I, I i would say if nori wins the match we have to come on before the final to talk about that how about that yeah yeah that's fair let's, let's do that fair. all right guys thanks for your time and i'll see you guys next time all right thanks, thanks for you guys